Coming up on 2020 on ID. A small town. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody's in everybody's business. A deadly feud. It's delusion, it's depravity. And a whole lot of lonely. A sheltered young woman with a little girl's voice living her life on Facebook. She was really good behind a keyboard, as long as she didn't have to do it face to face. But when online friendships unravel. I was a bad person. I was horrible. I went through a whole lot. She was always saying that somebody was mad at her, somebody hated her, somebody wanted to kill her. Everyone takes sides. I remember I wrote, please do not write on Janelle's Facebook. I beg you, please don't do this. The cauldron is boiling amongst these players, all egging each other on. Then... I didn't even know who was bad. Oh, my God. Two people murdered. There's no cross on either one of them. Kids. It was a precision execution in and out, happened very quickly. Facebook. Facebook. Facebook defriending that led to murder. And a bizarre tale begins to unfold. What a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Dashes of arms. We had rifles, shotguns, semis. Secret recordings. You got rid of everything. And a secret agent in their midst? Here's the CIA here. CIA? It appeared that there was some type of conspiracy here. That, you know, they, they kept referring to a guy named Chris. Taps on a keyboard lead to murderous mind games. You know, she may be operating on a fourth grade level, but she's got a PhD in manipulation. Hashtag unfriended. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. The story you're about to see is as old as time. It's about unrequited love, rage, and revenge. But it also has a frightening modern twist because much of the bullying and threats that fueled this tragedy played out online. And then there was the shadowy figure cloaked in emails. Who was he? And was he the one pushing someone to commit murder? As Matt Gutman first reported in 2015, it all took place in a tiny town just three square miles. To talk to someone there, all you really had to do was just walk down the street. Drive up the winding mountain roads of northeast Tennessee and you'll find breathtaking views, stunning scenery. They don't call it Mountain City for nothing. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody's related by blood or marriage to everybody else. They all go to the same churches. The sign at the city limits would like to suggest this is a congenial community of 2,500 with its arms wide open. The sign welcoming people to Mountain City says uh, a friendly hometown. Friendly to you? Uh, no. Why not? Because I wasn't born and raised here. I didn't grow up here. People here do not like outsiders. Janelle Potter could have used a good friend. Plagued with debilitating health problems since she was little, she's now a loner who spends most of her time inside this shuttered ranch house, under the watchful eyes of parents Buddy and Barbara Potter. What kind of person is she? Good-natured, sweet person. She's not an angry person. Naive, young, innocent? Yes, very naive. She's young in her mind, more young than her age, I think. And although she doesn't sound like it, Janelle is 30 years old. She looks good, right? Her room is filled with stuffed animals that stand in as friends. She doesn't work, doesn't drive, and she confides in us she's never been with a man. What were the rules? Don't be out past, you know, 12 o'clock at night. No smoking, no drinking, no partying, stuff like that. They are a God-fearing and gun-loving family. Even when they garden, they pack heat. Mom, Barbara, had a job with Hewlett Packard, and Dad, Marvin Potter, better known as Buddy, was a former Marine who served in Vietnam rescuing POWs. And later, he says, he served with the CIA. Sounds like Rambo. I just saw him as a gentle giant. But age has taken its toll. Both are now disabled, Buddy even on an oxygen tank. But Janelle's life support becomes social media. So because you didn't drive, that's one of the reasons that your social world became the computer. Yes. I had a lot of family pictures on there. Random pictures of sceneries, dogs. Selfies? Any selfies? Selfies. 
Mm -hmm. Did your parents have access to your Facebook page? Do they monitor yes. it? Yes. A woman in your late 20s and your parents have access to your Facebook page? Well. But a simple trip to the pharmacy would be a turning point in Janelle's life. Employee Tracy Greenwell remembers the day she first met Janelle. When she first came in, what did she look like? Sweet and innocent. I mean... She's got the big blue eyes, right? Mm-hmm. The sweetest thing you'd ever think you'd see. Tracy takes it upon herself to befriend the social misfit Janelle. We felt sorry for Janelle. She was sheltered and sick and stuff. She gave me her phone number and I started calling her. I would go out with her to um, the mall, uh, to her house and out to eat. They even got her to repel. These are pictures of the new Fast Friends at Backbone Rock, a local landmark. Sitting next to a scared Janelle is Tracy's brother, Billy Payne, a jokester who likes the outdoors. Did you ever get the impression that maybe she liked Billy? That's what the, everybody says. She fell in love with Bill, but I didn't. I still don't say it like that. Instead, Tracy tried pairing Janelle up with someone else, introducing her to Jamie Curd, an older man who's pretty handy with computers, the kind of guy who likes to wear shades indoors. Well, Jamie was sort of rough looking, you know, greasy, and she was neat. So why did you think to set up Jamie and Janelle? Hey, Jamie didn't have a girlfriend, and she really didn't have a boyfriend. I mean, they didn't look like they'd go together by no means. Janelle and Jamie became an unlikely item, hiding their relationship from her strict parents. He's at the Potter house from time to time, supposedly to fix the family's PC. But behind her parents' back, Janelle and Jamie would steal time and a few kisses together, snapping these secret romantic selfies. You and Jamie got pretty serious at one point. Yes. He, uh, he gave you a cell phone so that you guys could talk without your parents being on the phone. Yes. How often would you talk? Every day. For long periods? Uh, for an hour or two hours at a time. Now, take note of Jamie Curd and all that clandestine canoodling, because you're going to hear a lot more about him a little bit later. But even while she's with Jamie, Janelle is still secretly pining away for that outdoorsman she met, Billy Payne. And right around that time, something sinister is happening with her online relationships. She's being relentlessly cyberbullied. Appalling anonymous comments begin appearing on her Facebook page. What kinds of things were people saying about you? Just that I was a bad person, I was horrible, threatened to get raped. Must have been pretty scary. Yes. I remember I wrote, please do not write on Janelle's Facebook. I begged them, please don't do this. And Janelle thinks she knows who it is, pointing the finger directly at one of her so-called Facebook friends, Billie Jean Hayworth. What was her relationship like with Billie Jean? Oh, she hated her. From the get-go? Mm-hmm. She had call her all kinds of bad names. But we didn't know, I mean, she would not never say Janelle. It was always somebody else. Meaning Janelle was posing as somebody else, talking bad smack about, about. Yeah. And then when they would confront her, She'd be like, I didn't do that or whatever. There might be another reason these two don't get along. Billie Jean is engaged to, guess who? The object of Janelle's obsession, Billy Payne. Lindsay Thomas is Billie Jean's best friend. She was very laid back. Um, she liked to have a good time, always laughing, always had a smile on her face, just really easy going. And she and Billy had something to be especially happy about a seven-month-old baby boy. Oh, he was her world. Um, just, just this glow she had about her when he came into the world was just unbelievable. Friends say Janelle was so jealous of Billy and Billie Jean's relationship that she started spewing some online venom of her own. She talked about how bad they partied and they were on drugs and, you know, just all kinds of lies. I mean, it just got worse and worse and worse. Did anybody believe it? No. And then Janelle's posts turned vicious. That she wished that Bill and Billie Jean and that damn baby would die. An all-out Hatfield and McCoy-like feud erupts on social media, pitting Janelle against Billy and Billie Jean. The cauldron is boiling amongst these players, all egging each other on. She was always saying that somebody was mad at her, somebody hated her, somebody wanted to kill her. She was paranoid about it, I thought. But so far, it's all just virtual violence. But then it escalated. I was calling the police a lot. Yeah, they're trying to shut me up, but I don't like this because I'm very sick. They were wanting to blow my dad's truck. 
throwing rocks at the house. These are police photographs of a rock that landed in the Ponder front yard. Written on it were two names, Billy Payne and Billy Jean. And across the side, quote, I'm your Huckleberry. Now, at one point, did they unfriend you on Facebook? Um, I think that we did it to each other. I unfriended them, they unfriended me. Who unfriended who first? Um, I did Bill first, and I think Billy did me. And I unfriended her. But unfriending would only be the beginning. There's no talk. They're white. They're kids. There's no uh, baby involved. When we come back, the young couple's house becomes a crime scene. My impression after, you know, the first week was it looked like a hit. Like a contract hit. Right. Suspects in custody. And an investigation that leads all the way to the CIA. It's so incredible. The story is simply unfathomable. Stay with us. Thirty-year-old Janelle Potter has spent much of her life inside her room. Her world revolved around online social media. But an all-out feud with two friends has turned all their lives upside down. Now, this situation is about to take a very dark turn. Once again, Matt Gutman. Johnson County 911. At approximately 10.30 a.m. on a blustery January morning, a call comes into the Johnson County, Tennessee 911 dispatchers. There's a baby involved. He don't look right. The caller is a friend of Billy Payne and Billy Jean Hayworth. She's dropped by the young couple's home to find the back door open and inside something much worse. Their infant son covered in blood, eerily silent but unharmed. He's in one room, he's in the other room, the playpen. It kind of looks like he's trying to get to her baby. The baby's father, Billy Payne, and Billy Jean, his mom, the young couple who had been feuding with Janelle, have been shot. They can tell I down their faces, they're swelled, they're black and blue, they've been beaten. Okay, do you want to attempt to do CPR? They're both dead, it's too late. This murder, these murders, have literally torn apart the sleepy little town of Mountain City, Tennessee. No. Special Agent Scott Lott with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation takes 2020 inside the crime scene. And this is the bedroom where Billy was found. Single shot. Single shot in the face. Billy Payne's throat had also been slashed as he lay in bed. Down the hall in the nursery, Billy Jean had been cradling their baby in her arms when she died. That's how they find her, still holding her seven-month child. So it didn't take much time to get from that room to this room to shoot. No. And then this is five feet. I think it takes a cold-blooded person to shoot somebody holding a baby. Miraculously, the seven-month-old survived without a scratch. Investigators begin to examine all the possibilities. Of course, you know, the first thought is that you have to rule out, is it a murder-suicide? Is it a domestic situation? The second one, is it a um, drug deal or something like that gone bad or something? Were you able to glean very much forensic evidence from this scene? It's a very clean scene as far as physical evidence goes. So no prints, no shell casings, no DNA left behind? Not that we found, no, sir. Would that lead you to believe that whoever did this killing had some training? It looked like a hit. Like a contract hit? Right. But who in the so-called friendly hometown of Mountain City, Tennessee, would put a hit on a young couple who just worked at the local cotton mill? Word spreads fast in small towns like this one. And the day after the murders, Chief Deputy Joe Woodard goes to the Potter's home to talk to Janelle and her parents, Barbara and Buddy. We went to the residence and just more or less conducted an interview with them in the very beginning. Why did you decide to go to them? Because the, we knew that they had trouble with them. Trouble, like that social media catfight between Janelle and the two victims. Scott lost with a Tennessee girl. Oh, okay. The plotters don't know it, but the detectives are secretly recording their interview. What we're doing right now is investigating the double homes. Mm -hmm. Very serious matter. From the start, Janelle's dad is defensive. Everybody always points fingers at us for something. Oh, no, there ain't nobody pointing a finger. Do you know of anybody that would hurt them? 
won't get hurt. You know? Hell, actually, I don't. I feel bad about the situation because I didn't want no harm on them. Initially sympathetic, Janelle soon lets it fly about the bad blood between her and her former Facebook friends. They've been harassing me in my driveway, on our property, and then yesterday morning when I got on Facebook is when I found out. And, um, I mean, I'm sorry it happened, but, I mean, that's all I can tell you is they, they have been harassing the living crap out of me. Why would they be harassing you? It came out to be a jealousy thing. They said I was too pretty. But then the cops want to talk about somebody else. Remember Jamie Kurd, Janelle's secret sweetheart? Police know he'd had a falling out with the victims and took Janelle's side in the feud. What's Jamie to you? He's just a friend. We've been friends for years. He's a friend of our family. Yeah, I yeah, know He's a friend of all of us to me. Seems as if Janelle is still covering up her romantic relationship with Jamie from her overprotective parents. Does Jamie sound like your boyfriend? No. No. No, he's just a really good friend. Does he want to be your boyfriend? Not that I know of. But detectives are still suspicious Jamie and Janelle are a lot closer than she's letting on and wonder what he might know about the murders. Have a seat there, Jamie. So they haul Jamie Kerr downtown and ask him to take a polygraph. You can tell he's nervous. We confront him with the results of the polygraph. And the results? Kurd fails miserably. The polygraph indicates that he lied about knowing the identity of the killer. Now investigators think they've got their man. I think you went in there. I'm going to take care of this situation. I'm to take care of people messing with you now. People ain't going to mess with my girl no more. She's not my girl. You may say that out loud, but you know in your heart the difference. But hours go by and Jamie Kurt still denies that he's involved in the murders. Were you the only person there when they were killed? I wasn't there. Then, out of the blue, it's Jamie asking them a question. A bizarre one, which has the investigators dumbfounded. Is the CIA here? CIA? No. No. Jamie, in that interview, had said something to, to the effect of, is the CIA here? Of course, that was a very strange question to me. Did I ask the question? Yeah. Uh, what did you ask about the CIA? Because uh, he uh, said he works for them. It's going to be a major breakthrough in the case. Jamie tells detectives that he'd been texting with a mysterious man named Chris, who told him he was in the CIA, who says his job was to protect Janelle from her enemies. Is that he is going by Billy? But why in the world would a CIA agent be involved in this tiny town's deadly internet feud? There's 2,500 people there. There's a guardian angel CIA agent. I smell a rat. And when we come back... I'm not going to tell you I did something I didn't do. Why has Janelle's disabled father suddenly become a suspect? I said you would never, ever consider hurting someone over this, would you? Next. Have a to Jamie. It's 10 p.m. at the Johnson County Sheriff's Office, a department so small that the chief deputy's office doubles as an interrogation room. Jamie Kurt has been in the hot seat for nearly six hours, interrogated about the double murder of a young couple that allegedly bullied his girlfriend, Janelle. Let's tell you what's going to make you feel better when you tell us the truth. After a bizarre exchange with detectives about Jamie being in touch with someone supposedly in the CIA, Jamie's about to drop a bombshell, pointing a finger at someone much closer to home. Who shot? Hey, 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 buddy. Yes. Jamie's just named Buddy Potter, Janelle's overprotective father, as the killer. Buddy, the senior citizen former Marine who needs a six pack of oxygen just to breathe, He's not exactly your central casting assassin. Buddy Potter, because he has so many ailments. He's very ill. He's on an oxygen tank for Pete's sake. No way could he ever pull this off. In an attempt to save his own skin, Jamie agrees to help police snare Buddy. 
With detectives recording the conversation, Jamie calls his accomplice. It's a trap to get a confession on tape. Well, they're uh, putting fingers. Oh, Jamie, Christmas. You got rid of everything as for good, didn't you? Uh-huh. Okay. That makes me feel up there. It wasn't exactly a smoking gun, but it was enough for detectives to move in and arrest Janelle's father, Buddy, in a pre-dawn raid. Gun-loving Buddy was almost always gun-toting, so police were on high alert. We knew he had a weapon, and at one point we thought he made a gesture to us. What, what kind of gesture? Show me. Like he's going to do like this, and we grabbed his arm. And, and was he in fact armed? He was. Now it's Buddy's turn to answer some tough questions. You know why you're here, right? Yeah, I'm assuming. Okay, why do you think you're here? That somebody's told you I'm the one who killed somebody. Initially, his, his body language, you could tell he wasn't being truthful with us. Here's the thing. We're not looking at you helping us. We want you to help yourself. I'm not going to tell you I did something I didn't do. He denied everything. We pressed him and pressed him and pressed him. Are you the hardest killer? Which one are you? I'm protecting my family to start with, but I, I did not do this. Detective Lott then employs a tried and true interrogation tactic. Let the suspect implicate someone else. I think Jamie talked you into it. I think Jamie is secretly in love with you then. Okay. No. This is his way of proving to Buddy. And I can take care of her. I can protect her. Now. That wouldn't prove to me this thing. I'm here play now. But Buddy's not taking the bait, and Agent Lot is getting nowhere fast. So changes his strategy, switching from inquisitor to sympathizer. I believe you are sick and tired. The most precious person in your life being attacked and harassed constantly. I know that. Okay. Ever since. All this crap started. I've been, I've had my wife threatened. My wife has been threatened. They've threatened to take Janelle, cut her head off. Agent Lott's tactic works, and they're able to drill down to his motive. When you hear people plotting to take your, catch your daughter in a restroom and murder her, they want to rape her because she's a virgin. And just so much. Finally, after an exhaustive four hours, a broken buddy breaks down. He's crying. I'm I got it right now. So, Janelle and Bobby know what you do. Agent Lot senses that Buddy is right on the verge of a confession, so he uses another ploy, and they hit pay dirt when they get him to call his wife, Barbara. We let him make a phone call to Barbara. Barbara. Yeah. Before you find out from somebody else, I want you to know I was involved in it. I did it. What? Some of it. And he told Barbara, I did it. And that's as, that's as close to a confession as we got from him. Buddy's wife, Barbara, seems eager to provide him with an alibi. Your husband confessed to it. Yeah, but there's questions about that. So why would he admit to it? Why would he confess? When they took him, they took no oxygen. They took no medication. And they interviewed him for hours. And he, when he, his oxygen gets slow, he says things that don't make sense or are incorrect. He needed this to say, you know. You're not you, you're not you. But police think they've got a pretty good case, and now they're out to build it. They execute a search warrant on the Potter house. So did you notice anything odd in the house or anything unusual? Whenever the investigators went downstairs, there was a lot of firearms. We had rifles, shotguns, semi, I mean, it's just one of those. An arsenal. An arsenal, basically, yes. How downstairs. Many? I would say probably Close to maybe 60 different guns. 60? And it wasn't just in the basement. Guns in the corner of the bedroom, guns inside the dresser drawer, and guns under the mattress. There's even an ammo belt draped around his oxygen tank. 
They had guns out the yin yang. It's pretty overwhelming. Looks like Buddy's taking his right to bear arms to an extreme. Yep, that's an AK 47 you're looking at. And there were knives, too, all around the house, even hanging from the antlers on the wall. But there was more. We even found pictures of the victims that were in the living room. In the you living found room. pictures of the victims in the living room? Yes, we sure was did. Was this some sort of mourning thing that they were trying to mourn for the victims? No, I don't think so. No, it certainly wasn't. These were Facebook pictures of Billie Jean and her friends. Was anything written on them? I think one of the pictures, I, think, I believe one of them had like bitch on it. Which is kind of an odd thing to find after someone has been murdered in their house yes, holding their baby. Exactly. And something else you may notice, all the pictures appear to be ripped in half. The cops caught Janelle's mother red-handed trying to destroy evidence. Then all of a sudden she ripped it in half. And I stopped her and I said, give me those pieces of paper. In total, authorities seized 51 items from the Potter house, including the family computer Janelle spent most of her time on. And when they impound Buddy's truck, look what they find. Three enormous bags stuffed with shredded documents. We took those shredded documents, one of our agents spent a month of her life taping those back together. That agent meticulously reconstructed more than a hundred pages that turned out to be emails. The lines from the shredder still visible. The emails are between the Potters and a shadowy figure named Chris, who was warning them that the murder victims had been plotting to kill Janelle. It appeared that there was some type of conspiracy here. They, you know, they, they kept referring to a guy named Chris, uh, that's supposedly a CIA operative or, or something. Who is Chris? The stunning revelation about his identity and his jaw-dropping relationship to Janelle. Next. In any other middle American crime yarn, the cops would have called it a day. They've got two suspects in custody, Janelle's father, Buddy, and her boyfriend, Jamie, for gunning down Billy Payne and Billy Jean Hayworth. Now, both men have confessed to being involved, and both are awaiting trial. But the most unbelievable twist yet was on that Appalachian horizon. It's not really a whodunit to me. It's a why did they do it? Barbara Potter can't make sense of the fact that Buddy is behind bars. He's never been violent. He's never, even neither one of us ever broke the law. We tried to be, to do the right thing, always. And yet, there he is at the Johnson County Jail, accused of first degree murder. So how was such a heinous murder conducted? I don't, how would I know that? Remember, a search of the Potter's home reveals an arsenal of weapons and bags of shredded emails. At least 100 pages got taped back together. And in those emails, conversations between Barbara Potter and a man named Chris, who says he worked for the CIA. Warning Barbara about threats to her daughter's life. Chris was doing some surveillance and intelligence work, right? He said he was. Who is Chris? I have no idea who this Chris person is. What was his job? Uh, he was a CIA agent. What kind of stuff did he do? He said he was down here to protect me, protect my parents. But why would a CIA agent descend on such a sleepy small town? Could it have something to do with Buddy's service in Vietnam? Barbara says that part of her husband's past is top secret. Is he allowed to talk about what he did? No. Never. Was he ever in the CIA or attached to the CIA? Uh, he, he said he was. Chris told Barbara, Janelle's mom, he was watching their every move and was monitoring all that venom the victims were allegedly spreading on social media. He was watching these people, he said, that were harassing her on, on the computer and calling her. In Mountain City, Tennessee, there's 2,500 people there. There's a guardian angel CIA agent. No. Police are rolling their eyes, too. And when they take a closer look at the computer they've seized from the house, a eureka moment. Those emails from Mr. CIA man Chris were all coming from an IP address that belonged to her daughter, Janelle. Every one of them pointed straight back to the hospital road in Mountain City, which was Barbara and Janelle's home address. 
That leaves police to deduce only one thing. There is no Chris from the CIA. It was a creation concocted by Janelle Potter to convince her parents she was in danger. She invented this character. Exactly. Exactly. When she invented Chris, she could assume a different identity and be as hateful as she wanted to be. And prosecutor Dennis Brooks says the timing of Chris's appearance on the scene was no accident. The Chris emails start after Billie Jean Hayworth moves in with Bill Payne and gets pregnant. All this might seem far-fetched, but assuming a false identity online happens more often than you think. It's called catfishing, and there's even a whole TV show about it. How come you've been pretending to be someone else? Um... So she's catfishing her mom from the same house, from the same computer. She bought it hook, line, and sinker. How is that possible? Buddy Potter, at some point in his military career, had some involvement with the CIA. I think his wife, Barbara, was enamored with that. And Janelle grew up in that environment. So I believe the more she fed that back to her parents, the more it just kept growing and growing. It's beyond absurd. In all catfish cases, at some point, the, the victim of the catfishing is, is, is guilty of some degree of being naive. But Janelle's mother, Barbara, is about to go from naive to nefarious. And in those email exchanges, it sure sounds like she wants Billy Payne and Billy Jean dead. In one email to Chris, Barbara writes, we've had enough. No one wants to kill anyone, but we will. Barbara would take this information and show it to Buddy. Buddy, look. Look what they're trying to do to Janelle. Look what they're trying to do. And finally, they just pushed him to his limit where he couldn't take it anymore. Janelle just catfished herself and her mom into police crosshairs. Now the cops want to know where they were the morning of the murders, focusing on the wee hours when Janelle is exchanging secret text messages with her beau, Jamie Kurd, and it sure sounds to police like Janelle knows exactly what her father and her boyfriend are about to do. At 4.39 a.m., this message. Yes, he's leaving now. I hear the car. Police believe she's talking about her father on the way to pick up Jamie. The final text a minute later. I love you. Text me ASAP when you get back. And then all of a sudden the text messaging ends. And presumably around 5 in the morning, Buddy picks up Jamie and they drive over there. Over to the victim's house where they savagely kill Billy Payne and Billy Jean. For prosecutor Dennis Brooks, it's all proof that these murders were a family affair. And one thing that was very telling about Janelle being involved in the, in the preparation for the killing is, is the text messaging she does. Coming up, Janelle in jail, where our interview turns sour. Chris was you. No. You are Chris. I can't do this. <laughs> you think we're done there? We're done. And will Barbara throw her own daughter under the bus to save her own bacon. I love her, but I'm not going to serve life for her now. Stay with us. The Potters got problems. The trial for a mother and daughter charged with murder started today in Jonesboro. The courtroom was filled with emotion as Barbara and Janelle Potter were arraigned. Prosecutors accused them of masterminding the murder of a young couple they had bickered with on Facebook. The family patriarch, Marvin Buddy Potter, confessed to killing Billy Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth and was found guilty at trial. He is serving two life sentences. His accomplice, Jamie Kurd, copped a plea deal for 25 years, but now under arrest is what's left of this dysfunctional family, Barbara Potter and her daughter, Janelle. Charges for three murder. Three and a half years after the murders, the mother and daughter had their day in court. Through seven days of testimony, prosecutor Dennis Brooks tries to convince the jury that Janelle was really the one who authored all those emails supposedly from Chris, catfishing her own parents and goading her father into those executions. Case in point, all that childish writing and those misspellings. R-E-S-O-N, similar uh, throughout the documents. Ironically, it's the same argument her attorney, Cameron Hyder, makes in her defense. Janelle Potter operates on the level of an eight or nine-year-old. Essentially saying Janelle lacks the brain power to mastermind a murder. 
my client is not guilty for having an overprotective father. So just because Buddy went and did something horrific doesn't mean that Janelle directed him to do it? Absolutely. She is not capable of directing anyone to commit murder. It's just not in her. A countrified cast of characters takes the stand, but one prosecution witness brought gasps to the courtroom. My name is Christopher Jaden. Chris Jaden, a handsome former high school classmate of Janelle's, one she hasn't seen in 15 years. She was, uh, you know, one of those kids that <laughs> just very strange. But Chris must have made a much bigger impression on her. Because this Chris is the person whose identity, Janelle, stole to catfish her family. Chris works for security, all right, just not national security. The second Chris comes in, her eyes were just drawn to him, would not leave him. As he testified, her eyes were fixed on him. Because he's the real thing, and he's a good-looking guy. She apparently thought Billy Payne was, too. Which is why if she couldn't have him, said the prosecutor, nobody could. Janelle Potter had a crush or some kind of good feelings toward Bill Payne. A biblical crush on him, an epic crush on him. And when he moved on with Billie Jean Hayworth and they had a child, that was it. She went berserk. They would talk about the baby, baby Tyler. They would call him that damn baby. That baby needs to die. No one talks that way about an infant other than a woman, perhaps, who is jealous that that's not her infant. But the prosecutors have a problem. Their evidence is entirely circumstantial. There is nothing directly linking Barbara and Janelle to the crime scene. But can they link them to the convicted murderer, Buddy? If he's not subjected to Barbara Potter as his wife, Janelle Potter as his daughter, is he ever going to be in that kind of situation? He ended up being exactly what he said he was, a contract killer. Yeah. Killing on assignment. He did do that on their wishes. Even if a jury believes they are involved with this, do they take that leap and call it first degree murder? But the jury jumped in with both feet. We, the jury, find the defendant, Barbara May Potter, guilty of first-degree murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Janelle L. Potter, guilty of first-degree murder. A Washington County, Tennessee jury convicted the pair of first-degree murder in the deaths of Billy Payne Jr. and Billy Jean Hayworth back in 2012. For the families of the victims, an emotional scene. A lot of relief right now. I'm glad this is finally getting over and that maybe we can let Billy and Billie Jean rest now. And it's amazing to me that these murders were carried out without Janelle Potter ever pulling the trigger herself. Janelle and Barbara got exactly what they took away from Billy Payne and Billie Jean Hayworth. Life behind bars. Shortly after their conviction, I meet up with the big house bunkmates. They chose not to testify at the trial, but we put the questions to Barbara and Janelle that they didn't have to answer in court. Why did you write to Chris that you wanted them dead? I didn't. Yeah, you did, from these emails. Well, you can believe those emails if you want. So who wrote this one, How would I two, know? three, I might have four, wrote, started an email five, that got changed. Six, well, you can do seven, you I'm telling you. Eight, nine, <laughs> ten, eleven page email. Eleven pages. Mm -hmm. That's a long email. And you write, I will kill if I have to. Not just hurt, but kill. That's not me. That is not me because I'm not that kind of person. I'm not evil. But probably the most revealing email isn't one Barbara exchanged with Chris, but rather one she sent to herself. A link to a Billy Graham article on forgiveness and murder. A couple weeks before the murders, you had uh, searched, can God forgive a murderer? No, I didn't. You That's didn't. not me, no, I did not. I don't want anybody murdered. I did not do that. Maybe you know? I don't know. I would hope not. Do you think if you passed that you'd go to heaven? Yes, definitely. And with a clean conscience. I could die right now. And I would feel good about it. I would go. I love my daughter. I love my husband. But I would not sit here and lie for them. You wouldn't take a hit for your daughter? No, not me. I love her, but I'm not going to serve life for her. No. Apparently, there is a limit to this mother's love. But what's not in short supply in this family are lies. Can God forgive your mother? 
I'm sure. What about you? I didn't murder anyone. You don't have any responsibility for the murder of Billy Payne, I Billy don't. Jane. No. None. No. No, but you hated them after I time again and again. I didn't hate them, I just disliked them. You hated them enough to tell your father that they were really torturing you. And you must have hated them if what you say is true, that they were harassing you time after I time again and again. I didn't hate them, I just disliked them. I wanted to quit. I wanted the harassment to stop. I went through a lot with them. But I never wished them dead. I never wanted them dead. I <laughs> Janelle begins to cry. Is it real? Or is it just another move in her game of master manipulation? <laughs> Chris was you. No. You are Chris. You invented him like you invented other characters. No, I didn't. You didn't? No. Just happened to be from your email, from your computer, with your fingertips. No. It was from your IP address, I... from your email address. I don't think we're going to get into that. She said Everything no, leads don't... back to Chris. Chris and apparently she's... And she's created she's not... this scenario. She stated she's not Chris, and that's what she maintains. <laughs> Do you feel like you had any responsibility done. in doing this to him? Janelle Potter shuts down in tears and walks out of our interview and back to her cell. The family that just a month before the murders spent Christmas posing for photos together, now taking a very different kind of snapshot. Does it make you feel any better? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad. I want them to pay for what they've done. I think that Janelle and uh, Barbara are where they need to be. I think they, they deserve every bit of what they've got. The tiny town of Mountain City has gone back to its daily routines, but many people question whether the heart of this story is not about social media, but about something far more timeless. At the root of this case, Janelle Potter was like a lot of adolescent girls who aren't fitting in in a community. It, it turns into an anger. That's what it boils down to. It wasn't defriending on Facebook. It was a jealousy issue. It's somebody with too much time on their hands. As of 2016, Janelle, Barbara, and Buddy Potter are all appealing their convictions. Mother and daughter are serving their time in the same Tennessee prison. Both will be eligible for parole in the year 2073 when Janelle would be 91 years old. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.